having introduced uh, Mr. Kenwa and uh, Mr. Trevor, I uh, want to say welcome to you all. And Atat, thanks so very much for joining us. And um, Mr. Trevor, say hi to us. Hi. Hi, everybody. Good to have you join us, Mr. Uh, Trevor. Mr. Kenwa, can you hear us? Say uh, hi to us, please. You can hear us. Um, it's quite unfortunate that Mr. Kenwa cannot hear us. Um, I think before that is done, before we get done with this, we'll get to uh, get that sorted out. So we'll start now. The topic or the issue of uh, conversation is accountability and um, prevention of corruption. So, uh, Mr. Trevor, uh, what would you make of uh, this issue? What would you make of it? What, what, what's your take on this issue? So corruption, um, prevention of corruption, accountability. Well, uh, we all know that corruption is like a, a cancer in our societies, um, but it's grown up for many reasons. Um, and some of them have come out of society, some have just come out of greed. Um, so let me just share a few thoughts. One is to try and understand what what is corruption, um, because um, when I'm in some countries uh, and they ask me to do something, they they don't use the word corruption. They say, can I have a little something to eat or, you know, little extra something or something just to leave us feeling good or there are there are lots of words we use to not so that we do not use the word. Uh, and what we're basically saying is uh, what you're giving me is not enough. For you to do something with me, you've got to give me more. You've got to give me more than uh, is expected. But if you think about why, um, like when I was in Malawi, you know, the corruption amongst the police force was huge. Um, same in Sierra Leone. But when you look at how much these police earn um, they don't earn enough to live on so um, they're hungry so um, they create a system whereby they have to earn more money than they're being paid so you could argue that the issue of corruption could be dealt with by paying them properly so that the issue of corruption is then driven at a much more national level People are hungry. People want to eat. I think the other thing is is fear. Is the fear that uh, I'm I might be able to eat today, but what about tomorrow? How can I so? How can I get twice as much money as I need today, because I might not have any money tomorrow. And um, so then. It, it just becomes a way that we, the way that societies get enough money to eat. I think that's at the base level. But then I think it is the character issue, and some of that is around greed. It's around not telling the truth. Um, and okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. You could see, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Trevor. Let's so, uh, now. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Kenwa has enabled his audio. Can you hear us now, Mr. Kenwa? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. All right, thank you very much once again for joining us. And this is a conversation on uh, accountability and the uh, prevention of corruption. And, uh, yeah, please to be here. Okay. Well, now, uh, Mr. Kenwa, could you tell us, uh, take, could you just uh, highlight uh, some things about uh, this issue of accountability and uh, corruption, the prevention of corruption? Well, I, I think uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the issue of accountability, it's um, the first, it's the right of the people. And second, it is what is expected. It is, uh, as a matter of fact, I want to see it as the privilege of leadership, your ability to get the people understand what is actually happening. Leadership is a trust. You know, when people give you a position, they have asked you to 
decide what happens to them. They have asked you to manage their resources. They have asked you to manage their time. They have asked you to come up with policies to better their lives. So accountability should actually be seen as a privilege to first carry the people along, help them to understand the far you've been able to get to the, the challenges, some of the things they need to you know, find out about that. And sometimes you discover that people, uh, uh, a leader's perception could be very, very poor. Not particularly because the lady, the, the, the leader uh, probably made away with public funds or uh, uh, didn't uh, do all you need to do, right? But for failing to be transparent, for failing to allow people to see through, the, through his art, through his, uh, his books and all the rest, you know, of course that creates suspicion. And people want to wonder, are you really sure this person is living up to you? Uh, what is expected. And I think it, it calls for concern, but most importantly, accountability is an obligation. And every leader must need to leverage on that opportunity, you know, to, to make them uh, express themselves to the people and carry them along in, in, in the assignment, which is not just for the leader, but also the follower. Mm. Oh, oh, okay. I think you missed the treble. And then... Uh, okay. Okay. Up, up. Uh, it's good. I, I I like I liked what my friend was saying. I think it's right. I agree with him. I think one of the things around um, to say what what harm is it doing the nation and the individuals is we need to be transparent about the impact. So pe people want to have more money. They want greater income. But um, like my friend said, you know, leadership is about trust. Okay. Uh, and the economy is built on trust. You know, 99.9% .9 of the economy is built on trust. And yet what corruption does is it undermines trust. So actually corruption is destroying the very livelihoods that people want to create. So it's like we are trying to stand on solid ground, but we are digging a hole underneath ourselves at the same time. Um, so I think we can do more to speak out and say, look, this is the impact. This is actually destroying the nation. This is destroying trust. If we don't have trust, trust is like the grease in every human relationship. If we destroy it, it doesn't work. Business doesn't work. If I don't trust you, I won't do business with you. So we are we are destroying the very thing we want. Okay, um, thank you uh, very much. Now we have been joined by uh, Tochuku Odemene. Tochuku Odemene, thanks so very much for joining us on this conversation on accountability and um, prevention of corruption. So, Mr. Okenwa, as a uh, Nigerian-based uh, leadership coach and um, of course, I know you've been doing so well the, uh, at the end, uh, doing uh, campaigning against uh, so many activities as such as it relates to corruption and leadership and all that. So how would you um, rate Nigeria, I'm talking about Nigeria, and before we go to the uh, outside world, we are here in Nigeria. So before Mr. Tebo uh, gives us his experience of, of this issue uh, from his own end, let's get to hear you speak on that. Thank you. I think uh, just like uh, like in Nigeria and uh, some other African countries where you have the very worst leading the very best. And that is the case uh, of that in, in Nigeria. Maybe like just imagine maybe in a company you have the least leading the best. And of course in a situation like that things are already out of order. Because sometimes when you evaluate the level of people you know that are engaging in the uh, state of leadership you begin to wonder that this thing should not be so when you have like the renowned intellectuals from nigeria you know who are representing well in places like the world bank you know the africa african development bank at un of course when you talk about un general assembly uh, a nigerian is the president secretary general of the whole un but in a nation like that, with also with the likes of Ngozi uh, Okonji Wala, the likes of Obiaz Okwese, the likes of King Selemoala, it is really unfortunate to still see people who we wonder whether they have like the basic qualification to even run for offices, people that have like 
criminal record. People that you and I know that where they ought to be is in the prison and not in the palace. And automatically, it is often a judge that a, a people is as good as its leadership. As good as that assumption might be, I think it is not entirely true. Because the truth of the matter, we have good people, we have hard-working people, we have honest people in Nigeria. But unfortunately, because these are the very eyes, these are the diplomats, these are the ambassadors, the rare ambassadors to which people could assess the nation. So when you have a president commit a blunder or a governor, automatically the same kind of image is bequeathed on the citizen. And it's an anomaly. It's something that will come to life so far. But I still want to maintain that in this same Nigeria, of course, which is one of the fastest growing economies also before like the, uh, the recent uh, downturn, I would say that that is also made possible because in the banking, we have like some of the best minds in aviation, we have some of the best minds in real estate, we have some of the best minds. And it may interest you to know that in real estate uh, uh, sector across major industries, Nigeria played very key role. Of recent time when I was in UAE, you know, having a chat uh, uh, with those, one of the, uh, the major uh, real estate uh, uh, providers over there in the UAE. And he did mention that in most cases, like Nigerians, you know, patronize them a great deal. You understand? It was like, you will have lots of money and all the rest. And it was on me that I should come and invest. But then you come to see, and we, and, and just of, of recent, also we saw a Dino Malaye who was dancing, you know, jubilating a politician. You know, that he bought a big house in Dubai and Dubai and he was celebrating that people should rejoice with him. And you and I know that uh, judging from his salary, he doesn't really want uh, owning such, you know, a kind of building that can only be compared with uh, 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 the palace of, of the king in Dubai, which I was also privileged to visit uh, when I, I visited the UAE. So I think the basic problem of Nigeria, and just like the legend, Chino Acha that summarized it, that the problem of Nigeria is leadership. And with this leadership comes corruption. Because when you have leaders that are not patriotic, leaders that are not sincere, okay, like one of the things that is expected of a leader is to declare assets. When last did you hear a Nigerian leader declare the assets? And sometimes when they do that, you know, it's all fun. Like uh, 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 the current president, you know, before he ran uh, for the office like the first time, who hear him say things like that, all he owns was uh, 150 cows. And he doesn't even have money for to pick uh, the presidential form. So when you have leaders that are dishonest, automatically that impact on all of the whole system. But when we begin to have like those of them that, in fact, when they look at their records, it's clean, then we are sure to get it right. All, all right, thank you very much, um, Mr. Okenwa. Um, now, I think um, Mr. Trevor would... Uh, just have to give us his uh, experience uh, and then try to let us get to know how this issue is like over there in UK and let's get to find out from Mr. Trevor. Mr. Trevor. <laughs> well, I think every country has its versions of corruption. Okay. And um, so uh, the, the hardest issues of corruption, I think, in any country is when it's embedded in the leadership of the system, like my friend is saying. As soon as it becomes, this is the way we do business. This is the way things work. This is the way the politics works. Um, that, that then, then we really have to try and work out how do we address the heart of the system. And... Um, and that takes more than one person. That takes a group of people. I did a thing for a group of youth here in Nigeria uh, a week ago. And I said, look, own, fighting corruption is very difficult. But I said, there are 10,000 young people in this network. And 10,000 10, young voices saying, this is, the, this is the leadership we want. This is what we expect of standards. This is what we're going to live by. This is what the future will look like they will be listened to. So in, in a way that one person will not be uh, be listened to. So, you know, I think uh, and one thing I encouraged them was make the case. You know, people sit and they, they moan about corruption. They moan about it. Well, make the case. Why is corruption bad for you? Why is it bad for the nation? And actually speak into the facts. 
That's what I'm saying. 99.9% .9 of the economy is based on trust. So corruption destroys a nation's economy. It makes and it increases the gap between the rich, the ones who can afford the houses in Dubai, and, and those who cannot even feed their children today. And that makes it, and that makes a nation insecure. So if there is the gap between the rich and the poor increases insecurity in the nation. Okay, Mr. Trevor, Mr. Trevor, just before we continue, and uh, Mr. Okemwa, once again, this is a conversation on um, accountability and prevention of corruption, and it is uh, a program we call uh, Way Forward. My name is John Best, and I really want to appreciate you, uh, Atat, for joining this uh, conversation. I really do appreciate you, uh, Joseph, for joining this conversation. And we've been having it with uh, Mr. Trevor, a UK-based uh, mentor, leadership coach, and all that. And also, uh, Mr. Kimwa, uh, who is also a leadership coach and a public analyst here in Nigeria. So, um, Mr. Kimwa and um, uh, Mr. Trevor want to, want to um, get to know how to relate this uh, issue of accountability and the uh, prevention of corruption with the current situation of things talking about the uh, pandemic, how would you uh, say that uh, nations or countries have actually uh, displayed levels of uh, corruption in this uh, context? Thank you. And how can we overcome it? I think we'll start with uh, Mr. Okemwa. Let's uh, get to hear you, sir. Thank you. I, I think uh, you, you can actually visibly see the corruption uh, in all of the conspiracy theories. Uh, as we speak at the moment, we are here to confirm if actually this broke out from uh, a Wuhan laboratory or from the wet market, up to now, it is still very much a puzzle. And it is not as if to say there are no people that really know. Because, of course, if it came from the lab, some people must have created it. And, of course, if it came from the wet market, it's a fact. But we have two narratives. And beyond that, several other narratives of uh, concerns of whether it's a 5G that is actually creating the fuel air effect. Some other concerns of the fact that before now is actually been mentioned in some books, some movies also have tried to like create a narrative. But then, looking at the realities on ground here, we know COVID-19 is real. But in all Nigerian kids, where you can actually come in isolation centers and see people dancing in isolation center, see people eating in isolation center, you know, you begin to wonder, is COVID-19 the one we have in Nigeria? Is it the same with what you have in other places? Mm. Because you just see people like recovering the, uh, by the day, you understand? And then you could also see the same government officials who would say, okay, when somebody has this virus, the body of the, of the of the disease must not be released. We saw a case when the chief of staff said, Mr. President, died. The body was not only released, but we saw the same people who were advertising COVID-19 gather a mass, no social distance of that. Mm. And you begin to wonder if people in the top echelon could actually flout like some of these rules openly this way. Is it really true? So like an average Nigeria will tell you that yes, COVID-19 in UK is real, COVID-19 in America is real. Because the facts are there. You see people on the intensive care unit. You see people uh, with, uh, with ventilators, you understand? You see them lying on the bed. But here in Nigeria, you rather see people take selfies, people dancing. People eating, and of course, part of the corruption also is that they even know that what they are taking there is a malaria drugs. You understand? So many people actually query, is it really real? Because, as you also know, most governors and even the president rarely address the people, giving us timely updates. In Nigeria, for instance, before you ever have a presidential speech, you know, people will need to like, you know, do some level of activism to get Mr. President to speak, mm. which ought not to be so. It's not like we've seen, even uh, in the case of uh, UK, where Boris Johnson, when he was also challenged health-wise, we, we saw him, he made every effort to still even uh, address his people from there. But in Nigerian case, he could come maybe once in two weeks. In fact, the last one that is supposed to come up after two weeks was also uh, postponed, you understand? Just okay. some uh, a few minutes. Okay, well, uh, you've, so established, a you've established the fact that uh, COVID-19 is, is real. Uh, the only thing uh, you're yeah. trying to make a point out here, which is not very clear, is um, uh, whether you, say, you mentioned something like a conspiracy theory. Uh, is that coming from the government? Yeah. The, the, the idea there is that as, as we speak now, even between China and US, 
there are still concerns of the origin of this virus. Okay. And based on that particular thing, there is a question on that map. And then it also came with other suspicions, like that of the vaccine. Is it really for population control? Why the choice to start with Africa? And then all of a sudden, we see like the National Assembly sitting, you know, to review the infestious view. Like some of these things are suspicious, and they did that under uh, like some forms of security. Okay. Without really carrying people along to ask them what exactly do you want and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's a concern. Okay. It's a concern. Uh, so, right. not carrying people along, you know, really creates suspicion. Okay. All right. Thank you, um, Mr. Okemwa. Uh, let's get to hear you uh, speak to us, uh, Mr. Trevor. What would you say of this uh, 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 as it relates Sorry, to Sorry, your pandemic? line is breaking. Okay, I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. I'm asking. Breaking, what, yeah. what would you say of the... Um, the uh, how would you relate the issue of uh, accountability and prevention of corruption to the current uh, challenge we are having, which is uh, the, uh, the coronavirus disease pandemic? Um... Well, I, I don't. I, I, the danger is I'm not an expert. You know, I'm a I'm a sit, I'm a citizen of a country and of the world, and so I I, I see what you see. Uh, what I would say is uh, the importance of accurate information that is not politicized. Is is we all need good accurate information, and the problem is as soon as that accurate in information is politicized then we lose trust in the information so here in the UK for instance right at the beginning we were told you don't need to wear masks and we all thought that was crazy because if it's an airborne disease then everybody should be wearing masks and they said no no nobody needs to wear masks and we just like, well, it doesn't make sense. Okay. So then a month or so later, they go, ah, now you have to wear masks. And you go, well, this doesn't make sense. You know, the, the average person on the street knows and has some sense about this. Why are our politicians saying one thing when we know it's not true? So you've got that. And in the UK, we have a case at the moment where when uh, someone very senior in government has been seen to be breaking the lockdown rules. And um, normal people in this country are getting fined money for doing that. And yet, in the, and yet this person, he has not been sacked, he has not been fired, and the government just want to pretend that life can go on as normal. And the problem is, it comes down to trust again, is the trust in the government has gone right down. And when you lose trust, it's very hard to lead a family, a team, a group, or a nation. So right. even the issue around this, it, you know, it, it all comes back to trust. What builds trust? What breaks trust? It, it's a fundamental issue of leadership. All, all right, thank you very much, Mr. Trevor. Uh, Atat actually requested that he asked the question. And uh, Atat, so are you ready with your question? What's the question? Just be brief and then uh, we move on, uh, okay? Yes, I am. Oh, I thought... right, thank you, thank you, um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Drevo, and thank you, Jokomeka. I just want to say something in respective of this whole corruption accountability. When you look at the different countries, every country has a very funny story to talk about. Yeah. How can people hold government accountable? Because at the end of the day, we see government as people that are there and not people that are here. Mm. Forgetting the fact that we are the government. Um, looking at, we know corruption is expensive because for the layman, he's the one who gets the responsibility of wrong decisions of people that are made in the corridors of power. So how do young people who them and start with holding themselves accountable? Okay, let's, uh, uh, Mr. Okay, Kim, well, just in, uh, like, within uh, two minutes, you just attend to that, and then uh, Mr. Trevor also has to contribute to that. Thank you very much for that, that beautiful okay. question. Okay, I think uh, yeah. two, two key words that uh, uh, comes to mind quickly is advocacy, true advocacy and activism. In mm. okay. advocacy, you try to reach out to get the ears of the government, which is ever open. Because one of the wrong things that uh, some people actually do, right, 
okay. it's a situation maybe where you've not even reached out to those that are consigned okay. and you just go on the street or go to the press to start disturbing that the government is not doing this sometimes it's good to like form alliances seek for a court secrecy reach out to the government official or the person that is representing you to say see we have this idea this can be done let me give an instance like uh, uh, recently my city um, so like there is this this incident of like some kind of strange persons, mentally challenged people walking freely on the streets. So I thought what is going to be the best approach. First, I made a consultation with someone that works with the psychiatrics. And then thereafter, now, I concluded that the best thing would be to reach out to the Commissioner of Health, which I've already scheduled a meeting to first talk it over with them. And when the response is not coming, then activism cannot be the only option. It is said that those who make peaceful resolutions impossible they make violent revolution inevitable you know when you talk about activism like what we see now in, in minneapolis in, uh, in the u.s where like we saw a black man you know being, being stiffed to death he, he was gasping for air and then the, the officer couldn't just listen and he died but the people have to respond to riot because that's the only way to get the attention of the government Imagine just discussing, uh, the, uh, dismissing a cop like that without uh, jailing the person. It's not really fair. So in a case like that, when you know that trying to like push to the government will not get their conscience, so the only thing you now have to do at that point is activism. Mm. All right, all right, all right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kemwa. I think I give it up for um, uh, uh, Mr. Trevor to say something on that. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I agree with those points. I, I think that's right. I, Number one is, I, I think activism has to be non-violent, otherwise you, you just, you lose your voice. Yes, okay, we agree that. So it has to be non-violent. The, no, the next thing is, it does need to be active. It is, you know, people just accept things. So there are two sides to accountability. One is on the part of the leader making themselves accountable, okay. and the other is on the part of the people asking them questions. So so ask them questions. Ask for the facts. Ask for the data. What are you doing on this? And keep on asking. And even when people don't reply, you know, if if one young person asks a minister for some facts, they probably won't get any answer. If a hundred young people ask, then it makes a bit of a noise. If a thousand young people say no we want then what the young people are doing they're establishing a new norm they're saying we want transparency and they're not just saying it generally they're saying we want transparency on this issue on this fact so make it very specific um, all right but I, I and work together work together all right, thank you very much, Mr. Trevor and Mr. Okenwa. But at that, did you get that? Yeah, thank you. At, let's get to uh, hear yeah, if that. Thank you. That was. Thank you. All right, thank you so very much, at that. Uh, Mr. Okenwa, before we let you go, and uh, Mr. Trevor, you're just going to give us your um, final words, and you're going to uh, streamline it to ways we can actually uh, prevent this or the general uh, you know, idea behind it and how to just prevent it. Uh, let's see how to hold our leaders accountable, especially in this uh, period. Now there are uh, some amount, a huge amount of money was uh, donated by uh, good and well-meaning Nigerians and other bodies and companies. Are those people, are the, is the government really uh, putting these monies into uh, uh, the right use? Are they uh, sending those monies to the right channel and through the right channel? And then things like that. So your word, your final words in that, uh, in that line. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Okay, uh, my final word in that line, I think our people must learn to ask questions. Okay. Because it may surprise you to know that over the time, people seem to have forgotten that people actually donated billions okay, to yeah. this particular cause. And yeah. one of the things like I am not so comfortable about currently in Nigeria is reducing activism to merely an online stuff, right? Okay, you know, okay. we need to see people take legal action, mm -hmm. take steps like to call on the government to demand accountability. It shouldn't just be a trend issue. Because you know that sometimes in most cases it may not trend beyond 24 hours. And then other issues of, uh, you know, that are not so serious will begin to replace these issues. But I think, uh, like Trevor suggested, 
if you have a retinue of young professionals that are ready to collaborate, ready to come together, and then with a voice, demand for accountability, mm -hmm. it becomes stronger. All right, so I think you. there is need for mobilization and then corporate demanding. Uh, points you just made yep. there, uh, physical mobilization and then uh, the need to ask uh, questions by citizens and all that. Right? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Trevor. Yeah. Yes, and I agree with those comments. I, I'm going to say the issue starts with me. Yeah. Okay. If I do not end corruption in my own life, then I will not change it in the world. And um, we shouldn't just be talking about corruption out there. We have to check that it's ended right here. Because if it ends here and we build the moral character of people, so they are ready when they, uh, when they get office, public office, Part of the problem is that these kids, when they were kids, were seeing corruption every day. So we shouldn't be surprised when they hit public office at the age of 30 that they're corrupt. So we have to stop it right here in myself. And right. uh, I, uh, there's a book, and if you want me to put it online, I give you it's yeah. available. It's available for free to any of your listeners. I think uh, on, I on this exact issue. Okay. Uh, I think I should uh, show you, show them that book. I have gone through that book. I'm going through the book actually. Uh, that is doing okay. the right thing. Doing, doing the right thing. thing. You, I think it's available for free off my website. Uh, that you could find that uh, on uh, travel dot uh, travel world dot dot net, right? Travel, travel world dot dot net. Dot net. Yeah, it's for every young person in Nigeria. It's for free. All right, thank you so oh, very thank much. You. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. All Trevor. Right. Yeah. And, uh, thank you, Trevor. Uh, thank you. It's, yeah, thank you. It's, it's been a okay, wonderful bye. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> bye. Thank you. All right, it's actually... Yeah, uh, I must say, I must say, yeah. I can't agree with Thank you for your hosting. Thank you. Thank All you right, for hosting. It's, yes, it's a uh, way forward uh, with experts. Way forward and uh, way forward, we talk about issues as it relates to national building, youth development and all that. So today we just had to talk about um, uh, accountability and uh, prevention of corruption. I think uh, we've had that nice conversation with uh, uh, Mr. Kingwa, uh, who is uh, known as CEO, and uh, Mr. Trevor. It's been wonderful having you on this uh, a program on this show online program and i really do hope to have you join us again subsequently thank you yeah thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you very much thank you so much thank you meanwhile mr trevor mr trevor i think the uh your details you can get that from the website there yes mr okenwa is actually a yearly network influencer here in nigeria he is the leader of the uh, the executive director of Lead Network as well. Very good. He's been doing wonderful yeah, work thank here you. in Nigeria as it uh, concerns the young people. Okay, good. Well, there's well, lots of articles you. and resources on the website for leaders, and it's all for free for I you. Think next oh, week, amazing! Can amazing. we fix this again for next week uh, for another issue? Another yeah, sure, it's fine. Yeah. All right. Okay. So it's fine. Once again, my, name is, fine. my name is John Benz. I'm a broadcaster. Uh, media practitioner and the political executive director right mind network a network of like-minded young adults who advocate the issues as it concerns the young people uh, impacting the world that is our goal thank you so very much once again thank you 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 okay bye thank you